We're lucky to have an incredible guest on Bale Street today. None other than the guy who has written about Wall Street for years, has chronicled everything from his firsthand accounts of the excesses in the late 80s at Salman Brothers, chronicled in Liar's Poker, to the tech bubble, chronicled in the new, new thing, to the 2008 global financial crisis, the big short, where is where I met Michael, to the reasons behind the 2010 flash crash and flash boys and many more in between. Please welcome Michael Lewis to the show. You actually met Ira briefly when Vinny, Steve, myself, and you were having dinner at around the, the launch of the Big Short when, right, when Steve yeah. was convinced that Brad Pitt was playing him, turned out to be Corral. <laughs> That's still pretty good. But Ira came in, <laughs> shook your hand. He's a bail bondsman and happens to be my... Yes, uh, yes I remember. Exactly. He, has, he had a book written about him. Oh, is this Ira's story that you're playing out here on a podcast? Exactly. <laughs> Hopefully, I don't need him ever. But the theme is Bale Street, which I think you would love. And that is his world and my world combined. So what happened was in 2011... You remember when Dominic Strauss-Kahn was arrested. Things were stable yep. in the U.S. Europe was in an uproar. I was out to dinner with Ira and his wife, and my wife, and Ira gets a phone call, and he says, I got to go down to Manhattan. And we were up having dinner in Westchester. I said, why? He says, some guy, Kahn, got arrested. He's the head of the AMF. And the I bowling said, league. And I said, the bowling <laughs> league, Ira? The... And I go, I said, no. I go, you mean Dominic Strauss-Kahn? He goes, yeah, that's it. I go, Ira, that's the IMF. I go, they're literally deciding right now in Europe where to allocate money and what's going on. And so we realized at that point that our worlds can collide at various times. And so we started this podcast called Bale Street, which is when his world and my world collide, or maybe they do, maybe they don't. It could be someone doing insider trading. It could be mortgage fraud. We it's thought criminal it criminal activity on Wall Street. Yes. Which, which is what you've written about your entire life. And I so, get a lot of no, those guys. Actually, you know what? That's not really fair. I've never been that interested in the criminal activity. I've been interested in the activity that's not criminal that should be. That's true. So there's a really funny story that happened, Michael, and that is that I'll let Ira tell you, but he's in court doing something else completely not related to this at all yesterday. And Ira, you got to tell Michael. Yes. So, Michael, yesterday I go to court to get a bond signed and the judge says, hey, I read your book, Ira, The Fixer. And I said, oh, well, cool. Thank you very much. And blah, 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 blah. And he said, so what are you doing now? I said, well, you know, I was out in Hollywood. I did a deal with Showtime, but I got my rights back. But right now I'm doing some different things and I'm looking to get to do another TV show if I can get it going. But right now I'm doing a podcast with my buddy Danny Moses and his law clerk jumps in. He goes, oh, my God, I hear your podcast sometimes with Danny. In fact, da da da, da we start talking about some different things. Like, well, we got Michael Lewis coming out there. Michael Lewis, wow, from the blind side, Moneyball, Flash Boys, Big Show. I said, yeah. He goes, well, we got Sergey Alakoff in our courtroom. I said, really? Ah. He goes, yeah. He goes, he was arrested in the feds, and then the appellate division overturned it. They let him out immediately, and then the state brought the same exact charges, and they acquitted on one, and they convicted on one. One was a hung. And, you know, I let him out, and I wrote a 73-page decision on why he shouldn't even be in my courtroom. And I said, wow, that's great. And he started telling me a little bit about Sergey and his relationship, obviously, to you right there. So that's a small world right there. It's a small world, except Sergey seems to have been in every courtroom. So yes. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, it's, he's been hauled in so many times that the odds of you colliding with him somewhere in a New York courtroom are not that low. No, not at all. He's but like it, Kevin Bacon, six degrees. You see him all the time. All except for the fact that we happen to be talking to you 20 hours later, which is crazy. So... With that, Michael, why don't we talk about why Ira wasn't busy bailing out Wall Street execs at the time that probably should have gone to jail when the root of the global financial crisis was kind of uncovered. And now that the statute of limitations for anybody to be charged with a crime has passed, I would love to get your thoughts on that if you have any. Me too. I needed the money. <laughs> you know, at the time, so the truth is, look, at the time, and I probably said this to you, Danny, at the time, that I wasn't all that worked up about the fact nobody was going to jail. And the reason was, what usually happens when a couple of people go to jail, people think, oh, the problem's solved. The problem was just a couple of bad guys. Like when they put Michael Milken in jail. Yes. Oh, the problem of Wall Street in the late 80s is solved. We got the bad guy, we put him in jail. When the problems are really problems with the system, and when there is this lust to go put some Wall Street person in jail, usually they get the wrong ones. When the feds go after someone on Wall Street, for some reason it always ends up one way or another becoming an insider trading thing. That might have played a role in the financial crisis, but insider trading in the fixed income markets. But it, it was really a small part of it. And I think if you rewind the tape and ask why did even the interest in putting people in jail go away, I think it goes back to those Bear Stearns fund managers when it, the Justice Department I, it brought that suit and it was heard in, I think, in a New Jersey courtroom. 
And not only were these guys acquitted, but the jurors afterwards are saying things like, can I get their number because I want to give them my money to run? <laughs> I mean, it was just such a debacle. Unbelievable. And you also know that an awful lot of the really bad stuff that happened might have been legal. I mean, it probably was legal. I don't understand why it was legal. I mean, I don't understand why, for example, Goldman Sachs can create securities that are designed to fail so they can bet against them and then peddle them to the world. I, I, don't, I don't get that. Yep. But anyway, sorry, you got me going. No, no, that's no, good. That's the, whole, that's the whole idea. So the only people that I know that went to jail, there was some guy from Taylor Bean, there was mortgage bank guys went to jail outside of Wall Street, and then they got one trader from Credit Suisse for inflating his ABS valuations. He ended up going to jail for a period of time. That was pretty much it. And then when your book came out, there was a compilation of the countries that you were writing about in the state of California. Boomerang. Boomerang. Exactly. Iceland was actually the only country that I can really find that prosecuted the CEOs from the three largest banks and 23 other bankers, I think it was at the time, that got prosecuted. So Iceland did it. We didn't do it. But anyway, I just want to get your thoughts on that. Part of the reason why Iceland would have been quicker to do that kind of thing is everybody knows everybody in Iceland. There are only 350,000 people there. I mean, it's like the size of Peoria. <laughs> and everybody knew what had happened, and they remembered how it happened, and there was such outrage. The entire society was outraged. In particular, the women were just wildly pissed off at the men for having persuaded them that, yeah, they knew what they were doing, and they could stop fishing, and they could start banking. That's partly why. But also, you just have to look at what the laws of the country are. The thing that's so frustrating to me, again, when you rewind the tape, is that it feels like Wall Street has a really uncanny ability to structure the rules so they can do all kinds of horrible stuff that isn't against the law. So first you have to point to me, if you said to me, Michael, I think a bunch of people should have gone to jail. My next first question is, okay, what for? What is the law that got broken that people should have been put in jail for? And you probably have an answer to that, but I don't have a really good one. Well, you always said, and when you wrote, Liar's Poker, from the time you wrote Liar's Poker to the big short, when you move from private partnerships to publicly traded securities, you're risking shareholder money at the end. So you could just say they lost shareholder money or they were some type of fraudulent conveyance or misuse of funds versus when it was a private partnership back in the days, Solomon and so forth, that needed to be bailed out at the time. It was their money. So they're going to act a whole different way, human behavior, right? When you're risking your own money as a partner versus risking stockholders money. And it's just crazy to me that the fines were paid by the shareholders for the most part. The $150 billion that's been paid in the last eight years or whatever has been sucked up by the shareholders and no one was held responsible at all. And I know I was pissed because it could have made a lot of money at the well, time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're irritated that your business didn't boom on the back end of the financial crisis. The other problem, you know, when you sit back and you say these people in the big bank should have gone to jail. Goldman is, I think, in some ways the most pernicious because they got themselves on the right side of the trade and they created a lot of this essentially pollution in the financial system so that they could take advantage of it. But a lot of the banks were the dumb money. I mean, Citigroup and Merrill and Morgan Stanley to a slightly lesser extent, they were buying the very stuff that they shouldn't have been creating. And so hmm. it makes it hard to argue that they were involved in some sinister plot at the expense of everybody else, as institutionally anyway. I mean, clearly they were individual traders who probably were doing lots of stuff they shouldn't have been doing. But the institutions look like they were like as victimized as anybody else. So it muddies the picture a bit. But if you ask me, Michael, go try to make a case against someone who was actually really central to the financial crisis, who didn't get prosecuted, I would go right into Goldman Sachs and find the traders who were designing the pools of securities to bet against. That's where I'd start. And there was some noise about that, right? I mean, well, I can't remember the name of that poor French guy who yep. kind of got strung up. Yep. But it was always it was a minnow rather than a big fish. And I think you probably know who some of Danny, you dealt with the people who were the big fish. Yep. And I am surprised that there was never an attempt to prosecute them. If for nothing else, purely for the purpose of shaming them. And it is amazing, you're right, that shareholders pay the fines, the traders walk away and get to keep their bonuses, <laughs> and everyone kind of merrily moves along on their way. And, I mean, you're still angry about it, and I'm still angry about it. So am I, Mike. I don't think we're nearly as angry as, like, the country is as a whole. I'm really I think angry. That it's poisoned the society. 
Yeah. And I feel like now we can kind of switch to prior to you coming on, we were talking about kind of the changes in Washington and you've written a couple articles in the last few months, the craziness going on in DC. We were talking about Gary Cohn leaving the revolving door, the lack of continuity down in DC. And so you always said that you need a character to kind of jump out of you, to inspire you, to write a book. And you've obviously spent some time looking at not just Trump, but everything that's going on. So I would assume that maybe you're not fully inspired yet to do it, but I would love to get your current thoughts on what we should be really nervous about. You wrote about the Department of Energy. Rick Perry is basically controlling our nuclear weapons and Department of Agriculture is being run by someone who has no idea what's going on in general. And it has climate change involved in that category as well. So I would love just maybe spend a a couple of minutes on your current thoughts of what listeners should be worried about. Well, we have an administration that came into power not thinking it was going to come into power. I mean, Trump didn't think he was going to win. He did very, very, very little to prepare to govern. He was legally obliged to have a transition in place, a transition team. Uh, But then he fired him the day after he won. And there was no normal handoff of the government, of the entire two million person federal government, from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. And all sorts of expertise in how the places run walked out the door without ever communicating with the new administration. And then added to that, who's in the Trump campaign? It's a bunch of knuckleheads who don't know anything about anything. I mean, they're angry about stuff, but there's not a lot of former deputy secretaries of various agencies floating around. And there's not a lot of institutional memory for floating around the Trump campaign. It's all kinds of oddballs and outsiders, which isn't all bad, but in this case, it's toxic because I think that you basically have a guy who's supposed to be managing this enterprise, which is mission critical. I mean, people crap all over the federal government, but and yes, it's sloppy and inefficient in lots of places and so on and so forth, but it has a lot of missions that we can't live without being done well. I mean, what happens is the center of disease control falls apart, or what happens if the climate change data that's inside of the Department of Commerce is no longer reliable, or what happens if the nuclear arsenal is not well tended? Uh, you can go on and on and on. And inappropriate, inexperienced, unknowledgeable people, to the extent anybody's been appointed to run these places, Those people are the people who've gone in. And so I think it's hard to say, oh, well, what's the risk? It's hard to identify exactly what the risk is, but it's something like this. I think what Trump has done across the government is take – I mean, the government has a kind of a portfolio of catastrophic risks it manages. And I think he's made a lot of catastrophes slightly to a lot more likely. And you never know where the problem is going to pop up. Is it going to be a nuclear weapon going off when it shouldn't? Is it going to be basically we don't deal with climate change when we should? Or is it because we're not going to even know how the climate's changing because we're not keeping the records anymore? Okay. Well, you can tick down the list of things the government does that certainly not doing as well as it should right now. And my might not be doing it all. And when I think about my great fears about this administration, it's sort of the organ damage they create in the federal government. And it's not so much the day-to-day noise around the White House. You know, I remember you talking about this on an NPR interview, and I was frightened by what you were saying, that all these systems, all these agencies that should be doing run-of-the-mill stuff aren't happening. Is it going to be a problem for the next administration in three to six, seven years, depending on how long this person three. is in office? Hopefully three. three. Is the next person going to be able to transition and take over? Or is like, are these systems broken for the long term? It's going to be interesting to see, right? Because the longer it goes on, the more of a problem it becomes. And it depends on who comes in after him. I mean, it's not that there's these people who know how to run these things are all gone forever. They're just outside this administration. So there's expertise that can come flowing back into the system. But you just wonder what happens between now and then. What happens to the State Department? I mean, the State Department is effectively being dismantled. And that is our point of understanding and communication with the rest of the world. I mean, what happens when we don't have an intelligent dialogue with North Korea? Maybe nothing, but maybe they fire a missile at us. And those are the kind of risks. You just don't know. I mean, it's possible. I still think it's possible that the Trump administration plays this comedy in retrospect, that it ends up being this comic, farcical, Ron (laughs) Burgundy-ish interlude in American political life. And we all go, oh, well, now we understand we shouldn't have someone like that being president. Hopefully the worst thing is that Ryan Zinke approves the Trump Hotel Resort in Moab in a monument (laughs) park. 
you know, maybe that's the worst thing that happens is we get that out of it. So, exactly. Yeah, but, but then it's also possible it's all plays as a horrible tragedy, and I just don't know yet. Trump, it seems to me, inherently a kind of comic figure. He's such a buffoon. I guess maybe not hard to imagine, but hard to believe that he could wreak real tragedy on the society. Yeah. But oh, it's possible. It's scary. And but he's doing a great job. Great job. All winning. On that All front, right. just to stick with Washington and then we can move away from that. But do you have any faith? I mean, I still believe the market's rigged to a degree. You know, I know you and Brad both have said so on air and in the book, Flash Boys. I don't know if I have any faith that the SEC or FINRA or CFTC will do anything. As a matter of fact, yesterday, I don't know if you saw that the SEC fined the New York Stock Exchange $14 million. They had an open loophole, basically, in their trading system for a period of about seven years from 2008 to 2015 that a client reported, either a hedge fund or mutual fund, reported to the exchange that they saw that their orders were basically being front run. And so they paid this fine yesterday and really didn't admit or deny any wrongdoing. And that was as of 2015. I mean, so the stuff is kind of still going on. So I don't know if you have any updated thoughts on that or if you're still talking to Brad or what you're well, thinking. Well, I do still talk to Brad Cassio and the people at IX. I was over there just actually a couple of weeks ago. And I guess my thoughts are this. They seem to have some positive feeling about the new people in charge of the SEC, that there's some greater understanding now, I think essentially the, of the fact that the main stock exchanges have sold themselves out to a small class of high-frequency traders who are allowed to exploit everybody else in ways that are so arcane and complicated and diabolical because it's a little bit from everybody that they're stealing. Brad seems to think that the SEC is finally kind of getting its mind around this. But he said that to me several times over the last few years, and every time it turned out not to be true. And it just seemed to me the problem that led to the rigging of the stock exchanges, the problem is it's really systemic that the people at the SEC who were charged with regulating this, in the back of their minds, their out is to get a higher-paying job at a high-frequency trading firm or an exchange or someone who's part of the system. So it's not that they're all corrupt, but there is this corruption built in, and there's an industry capture of the regulators that make it very, very hard for the regulators to come down on the people who are making the money on Wall Street, because the people who are making the money are the people who are going to hire them. That hasn't changed, clearly hasn't changed. I mean, it is kind of amazing. It's become a social norm for someone to go to work as a regulator, or like the director of enforcement of the SEC, naturally thinks that it's okay to go work at Goldman or J.P. Morgan after he's had that job. In a fair world, if someone tried to do that, they'd be put in jail, that you should not have this revolving door. But it spins now so rapidly that people just think, oh, that's how you have a career in financial regulation. You mean Greg Berman, who ran markets at the SEC, and Ben Bernanke, who basically ran the world, are now working for... Griffin at Citadel, something like that, you mean? names now. There's not a high-ranking financial regulatory type who you can think of who has not taken Wall Street's money after he's got out. Right, can you think of anybody who shuffled off and said, oh, no, I won't do that because it's wrong? I mean, it either comes in the form of lecture fees or consulting arrangements or outright our jobs. And everybody just thinks that's okay. It's so in the air they breathe, they don't even, they don't even think about it. So how does that influence the discussion of what's right in the regulation of Wall Street? Hey, Michael, this is Ira. I just wanted to change subjects for one second. I'm a big fan of Moneyball, but a bigger fan of the blind side. And I wanted to get your take on the fact of what's going on right now with the NCA and all those violations. I got a phone call when all those coaches and some of the guys from Under Armour and Nike, and I'm not sure if Nike was involved. I take it back. I think uh, some of the uh, shoe companies were involved here. I think that could be your next book right there on what really is going on with uh, paying these athletes. It seems to me that the corrupt institution is the NCAA itself. Absolutely. What they're doing is preventing the labor that is actually providing the value from getting paid for the work. The players should be paid instead of the coaches and the institutions that they play for. People say, oh, yeah, they get a college education, blah, blah, blah. Mostly they don't. And even so, it's a trivial compensation, at least for the stars, for what they're bringing in. And when you put that kind of impediment in the marketplace, of course there's going to be corruption around it. I just think it's outrageous to me that some player gets publicly shamed for being bought lunch. <laughs> exactly. You know, by some booster. And, you know, he's supposed to feel bad and humiliated and all the rest. Right. But then you've got middle-aged white men getting paid $5 million a year to coach him. 
I think it's breathtaking. When I think of the scandal, actually, when I see some kid may have gotten a hundred grand under the table, I say good for him. And, and the there parent, more of it. it's utterly amazing that you're watching right now what's going on with Sean Miller, what's going on with Tina, what's going on with all these coaches that come out and how they've distanced themselves in a lot of different ways from whether it's boosters or, or the shoe companies. But I mean, this goes all the way back to the UCLA days. And well, the boosters it, goes, it goes back to the first big television deals that anybody gets for college basketball or college football. I mean, once the money starts to bleed into the system, it's amazing the lengths the NCAA has gone to, pretending it's a matter of principle to prevent the players who are providing the value from getting money. I remember the Auburn football program, I want to say it was 10 years ago, pre-Cam Newton or around Cam Newton, that boosters that own casinos we're rigging slot machines and telling the players which slot machines to go play down in Mobile. <laughs> I swear, it was true. And they totally That's got away great. with it. There's also this bigger issue. And this actually became a peeve of mine when I was working on the blind side because I saw Michael Orr coming out of high school and I saw, you know, there was this whole elaborate network to prevent him from getting a free meal. Now, he was a special case because he'd been adopted by a gazillionaire, so he was fine. But his friends who were these kind of poor inner-city sure. kids who were going to put their bodies on the line for some school that they weren't even going to really attend and not get a nickel. And the thing that really struck me was, especially in the, well, basketball and football, a lot of the players are African-American and are poor and, and come to the universities very ill-equipped to get the education. They have a brief moment, a year to four years, when they have all these rich white people who are really interested in them and want to be their friends. And that's a moment where if you didn't forbid the interaction but actually encouraged it, that there'd be all kinds of long-term benefits to probably both sides, but certainly to the athletes. They'd get jobs, they'd get social connections, you know, have a place in the world after they finish playing the sport. Most of them are never going to play professionally. Instead, the NCAA builds this wall between the two worlds to try to kind of prevent the interaction, and it just seems evil. Yeah. I mean, there yeah. are some of these students who, they're starving, too. Some of them, they're on meal plans that don't cover they're three selling, meals a day, and they're, they're just they're, they're starving. They're selling their books. They're selling And they're tickets. working their asses off starving. It's and terrible. It's just a shame out there. Listen, I, for years, before I became a bail bondsman, I owned nightclubs, but I also tried to become a sports agent. Do you just seek out the most noble professions? <laughs> That's my goal. Next, I also owned a strip club, too, Mike. I was the only one that bought a strip club and basically turned around during the hockey Are strike. Are there synergies, like between strip clubs? <laughs> and bail bonds and everything. And they must all I'm the seediest guy you ever met. <laughs> Those are clients in waiting. By the way, I rebelled out. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence Taylor. Yes, LT. Plexico Burris is yes. a crazy story. Plaxico. He shot himself in the foot. I go, I, he's not going to jail. I goes, remember, yeah. Yes, he is. I said, why? He goes, Bloomberg wants to prove a point. You can't carry a weapon in. I'm like, that had been anybody else. Oh, the Plexico L Burris goes to jail. LT was great. LT wanted to go to the Bahamas and play golf, and he called me. And I said, I gotta go, Lawrence, go, go do whatever you got to do. Just, you know, whatever. He's like, all right, man, but I got my bonds. He tells me I can go anywhere I want. I go, yeah, you tell that to the customs, too, when you go across there, because there could be a warrant for your arrest <laughs> if you go across there. The <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, Michael, talking about those are two books that were made into movies, Moneyball and Blindside. Is there anything else? I know you were working on something with Liar's Poker for a while. I know Big Short was obviously made into a movie, but any of the other books that you'd like to see go to the big screen that you've already written? Well, there, there are three that are kind of alive and bouncing around right now in the movie business that any one of which could go. The first is a little book I wrote about my high school baseball coach that, believe it or not, Will Ferrell has just Come yeah, on, called Coach. Bought. I read called that. Coach. Yep. And he's really interested in doing it. So, I mean, he personally signed the check. So if he wants to do it, that might just happen because he, I, I think, think he can so. kind of do what he wants. Then the Undoing Project, the story of the two Israeli yep. psychologists, was bought by Lionsgate, and they are now in the process of hiring a writer-director, like right now, this week. So that's a lot. That's great. And then the last one was, the funniest one was Flash Boys. Because Sony Columbia bought the rights for Aaron Sorkin to write the script. Aaron Sorkin never even started the script. He got an advance to write the script, but then he never did it. In the Sony hack, his emails to Sony were exposed. And he, after he did his deal, he then decided that he said that, oh, but you know that no big movie studio will ever make a big feature film with an Asian as the main character because there are no Asian movie stars. And can we do something else and oh, dead? That was in the so email that hack? Was in, oh, God. That was in the Sony hack. It was in his emails. 
so as a result, because he dragged his feet after saying he was going to do it, Columbia never even got a script, and they just dropped it. There was some turmoil in the studio. The people who bought it were gone. Typical story. So anyway, last September, I was on stage at the Library of Congress at the National Book Festival, and someone got up in the audience and asked me, what happened to the Flash Boys movie? And I said, I don't know. It's a black box to me, but I know this. And I told him the story about Aaron Sorkin saying that there's no such thing as an Asian movie star. As I was coming off stage, my phone was ringing from my movie agent saying, that was brilliant. I said, what was brilliant? He said, you've caused this firestorm on Twitter, and all these Asians are tweeting saying that Hollywood's (laughs) racist. And, And I'm getting all these calls from studios saying they want to show they're not racist. So Netflix, which has a big business in Asia, has rebought the rights to Flash Boys, and I think they're full steam ahead on it. I would be surprised if Flash Boys does not get made and Jet if it Lee. doesn't like launch some Asian movie star. Female Asian at this point with what's going on in Hollywood. I would combine both and just get, <laughs> get it all done in one shot. Diversity rider. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So do you want to talk about the podcast that you're actually launching this fall? or Not yet. Okay. Oh, that's uh, I want to wait until I'm closer to having it come out. Okay. Hope a you have me on, Michael. Not like yours. There's going to be music. There's going to be music? Okay. <laughs> I can good. sing, Michael, if There'll you want music, me to come on. You know, and there's actually going to be like plot. It's going to be written. It's not just going oh, to be scripted me talking drama. To cool. Very cool. Very cool. Michael, thanks so much for the time. Thank you, Michael. Good Can't talking wait to, to see. you guys. All right. Same, Michael. Thanks, bud. Bye-bye. I'm very excited to see what happens, not just with the Trump presidency, obviously, but with maybe some of these movies that are going to get made. Maybe I'll get another thousand dollars for my life rights to Flash Boys, <laughs> basically a big short. And I didn't realize that when you sign your life rights in a movie, that the movie actually on paper never makes money. Don't pay attention to what it grosses in the. They uh, have a lot of creative. Accounting. Yeah, a lot of creative accounting. And Ira obviously went through that when he sold his life rights for his book, The Fixer. Next up on Bell Street, Ira's going to talk a little bit about the updating the Harvey Weinstein situation. Speaking of Hollywood. 